My name is Jessica Clemens, and I'm the Interim Library Director at the SUNY College of Environmental Science and Forestry in Syracuse, New York. And I want to thank you all for joining us today uh, for SUNY Open Access Week. This webinar series is part of the SUNY Council of Library Directors strategic plan to bring awareness and understanding of open access to the 64 SUNY campuses and beyond. In addition to our truly wonderful speakers, this series was, series was brought to you by the work of a talented and dedicated committee made up of members from various SUNY campuses, SUNY Press, and Central New York Library Resources Council. Um, and I want to say a special shout out to CLRC and Matthew Kokel um, for hosting this Adobe Connect uh, webinar. So thank you very much, especially for all of your work there. Um, you can see a list of our members on the SUNY Open Access website, and I've posted that in the chat. Um, we hope that this webinar series will launch deeper discussions and involvement in open access for our community. And by community, we really mean the broadest sense of community. And the videos will be available after uh, the event. So yesterday, we had Megan Wacha from CUNY talking to us. That's already available online. Um, and after shortly after each uh, webinar, they're, they're posted online. So if you have to step away or if you know someone who wasn't able to attend, uh, if you're not, they'll be available at a later date. Um, so our friends at CLRC will be monitoring the chat in case there are technical problems, and I'll be looking at the chat window for questions. So feel free to type questions as you think of them throughout the presentation, but I want to make sure that Heather has enough time to share her presentation. Um, so after she's done, I'll facilitate the Q&A, um, just so uh, we make sure that we have enough time. Um, and finally, if you're so inclined to take part on social media, um, please, uh, it, let me encourage you to use the webinar series hashtag SUNY OA Week. Uh, we'd love to hear your thoughts. You can also tweet to Heather. Her Twitter handle can be found in the chat window. It's at hjoseph. And at spark underscore na is also a, a pretty good account to follow. Um, now it is my pleasure to introduce you to Heather. Heather Joseph serves as the Scholarly Publishing and Academic Resources Coalition's, or SPARC's, Executive Director. She leads the strategic and operational activities of the organization. She's focused SPARC's efforts on supporting new models for open sharing of digital articles, data, and OERs. Under her stewardship, SPARC has become widely recognized as the leading international force for effective open access policies and practices. Um, you can find a lot of Heather's work um, and SPARC's work online. And more recently, she's been asked to join the SUNY Research Council's meeting in December to talk about some of the issues that she's going to be sharing today. So Heather, Heather I really want to thank you for your time. And with that introduction, I will turn it over to you. Thank you so much. Um, and hi, everybody. It really is my pleasure to um, be here with you, uh, albeit virtually, during Open Access Week. Um, and what I'm going to do today is uh, focus a bit on open access, the, the big picture. And specifically, I will talk about the growing movement towards open in higher education, looking at some of the factors that are driving the movement towards open access try to unpack exactly what it is we mean when we talk about open access, explore a bit about how uh, we as individuals, uh, as faculty, as, as students, as researchers, librarians, can put it into practice, and then finally take a look at uh, what some of the impacts that this can have on us as individuals and our work, as well as uh, collectively um, as a society as a whole. So, uh, starting thinking about, you know, why are we, why are we uh, uh, talking about open access? Why are we talking about open so much um, over the past, you know, I would say, decade and a half? And I think it's no uh, surprise to anybody that some of the, the major drivers are, are technological drivers. With the advent of the Internet and the World Wide Web in particular as a digital communication tool, we've had incredible new channels uh, to share our work and to do our work and to think about and enact doing research, teaching, and learning um, really in an online environment. And it's been kind of phenomenal to have this environment that uh, feels like it's full of possibilities, right? This environment enables us to have access to more information. And unlike the print world, it gives us opportunities to do things with it that uh, we could only previously sort of dream about, um, which is wonderful. 
theoretically, this is the environment we're operating in. But I think as all of us know, um, the, uh, the, the world kind of doesn't look at, like a digital open utopia uh, for any of us who are operating um, online. And despite the promise of the internet, we find in higher education, in research institutions, um, and just as individuals, that the materials we most need the freedom to work with for research, teaching, and learning, textbooks, articles, uh, data sets, still remain uh, largely under restrictive access, pricing, and reuse policies, uh, largely. We, we find ourselves uh, operating in a mode where we really seem to have 20th century policies and practices governing how we're accessing and using 21st century information. And in specific, there are very real barriers that I think each one of us, hopefully these will, well, not hopefully, it's not a good thing that they'll feel familiar to you, but um, I'm, I, I'm banking on the fact that these barriers um, that I'm about to describe will be things that you recognize that you do run into um, uh, in your daily life, which have sort of propelled us to look for uh, new solutions for optimizing uh, the environment that we're working in. And the barriers that I'm talking about are technical barriers, legal barriers, and also financial barriers. So what do these barriers mean for you? How do they sort of manifest themselves in, in your daily lives? Well, sort of starting with technical barriers, um, I think one of the things that, there, there are lots of different kinds. I'm just gonna focus on one example of, of, uh, of a real uh, technical issue uh, that's facing us in this digital environment as uh, more and more scholarship and research, the conduct of that scholarship and research has moved into digitally enabled environments we find that the amount of information that we have to deal with is uh, just growing at an incredible pace. And this is just a graph from one discipline, from, from uh, genomics and genetics. And it shows uh, the number of uh, uh, data sets, data objects deposited into GenBank over a set period of time. And you can see that at the point where the human genome was digitized right there in the late 80s, early uh, 2000s, the amount of information started to explode. And it started to explode not in a linear fashion, but really exponentially. And we have this lovely you know, sort of reverse hockey stick curve that, that illustrates just explosive exponential uh, growth. Um, and the issue is that although the amount of information that we're asked or that we're, that's available for us to deal with and that we find ourselves needing to deal with on a daily basis is growing at this pace, our capacity as individuals to process that information using sort of traditional means, like you know, trying to read through it, has stayed the same. And my friend Cameron Nalen, um, whom I uh, have uh, borrowed these slides from with full attribution, uh, is fond of pointing to this slide saying, look, this is the amount of information that I'm being asked to deal with that's increasing at this pace, yet I still only have one brain. Um, and we find this curve, this hockey stick curve, uh, happening in any discipline that deals with sort of a large scale shift to uh, a digital environment. This is not native only to uh, genetics or to life sciences. It's any discipline that experiences this move, you'll start to see uh, this kind of um, attendant growth in, in, in information that we have to deal with. And of course, the, the previous graphs dealt with data and the, those data sets then have experienced an attendant increase in articles reporting on the insights that we as scholars, as researchers, are you know, taking out of that data. And the number of articles that are being published um, is, is also increasing um, on a similar, similar trajectory. And this graph just shows uh, sort of as an overlay to what happened in genomics. You know, a lot of genetics papers, uh, actually pretty much almost all of them, uh, are ultimately indexed in Medline. And you can see we have this, this lovely hockey stick uh, uh, curve mirrored in the, the journal article environment as well. And what that means to us is, is you know, from, a, from a technical perspective, we kind of run up against the limits of our ability to effectively process information the way that we always did, right? If we think about sitting down to read these papers and this growth in papers in just this one discipline over this time period, you'd have to be able to read about 100 articles per hour per day without sleeping to be able to process a year's worth of text in this particular discipline. And 
that's a statistic that you know is is from five years ago. That growth curve is is continuing. So I think that points out that um, we have a, a a technical barrier for being able to deal with the you know sort of embarrassment of riches of of uh, of digital information that's provided to us. We need to be able to apply the the, the uh, power of networks and really enable computers as a new category of reader to help us make sense of uh, the information that we need to do our work. But often we can't because in journal articles, as we're all aware, are often siloed on individual proprietary publisher sites um, or on sites that are not interoperable either technically or legally. Uh, the legal barriers that we face in being able to do our work are also very real and very present. Um, I think uh, m most of us understand that even if we can technically get to articles that we want to apply uh, text and data mining on or, or uh, computational techniques to help us um, understand, we are still largely operating uh, in a, in a paper-based copyright regime. Um, we can't read or compute on what we don't have permission to use. So legal barriers uh, stopping us from doing our work, I think, are, are things that are very real and that we run into all the time. And they're not, you know, I would say from, from uh, uh, their, their origins aren't sinister, right? I mean, we're all familiar with transferring copyright to a journal publisher. And I should say I was a journal publisher for uh, mainly scholarly societies for about 15 years. And the last thing that we would do before an article slated for publication, send an author a copyright transfer form and, you know, call them and say, unless you, you know, until you sign it, we can't, we can't schedule your article for a journal publication. And honestly, most authors would then just sign it and either, this was in the late 90s and early 2000s, fax it back to me or send a PDF copy. And they didn't really read it and didn't really think about the fact that that little section two in the bottom is really talking about, despite the fact that you own your work unless or until you sign away some or all of your copyrights, um, uh, they would just sign sign the copyright transfer form and transfer all of all of their rights uh, away regardless. And while that transaction might have made sense uh, to a certain degree in a paper-based environment where publishers were taking on a huge risk and a huge expense of printing and, and mailing uh, your work for publication, the same uh, kind of transaction doesn't really exist in uh, the online environment, and yet we're still operating as if it does um, in terms of legal constraints. And the final barrier that I think we are all, uh, no matter who we are in, in the community we run up against, um, are the financial barriers of being able to access the information that we want to work with. And certainly we in the library community are um, intimately familiar with uh, the, in, the increasing and incredibly high cost of being able to provide access to in specific um, journal articles in science, technology, and medical journals. Uh, you can see that uh, the average cost per year for uh, titles in different disciplines really runs the gamut, but with STM journals being um, quite expensive, averaging around $5,000 a year per title uh, in chemistry, uh, close to that in physics, um, a significant amount of, of, of scratch for an individual campus to have to put in. And when you think about this on a cumulative basis across our campus, you realize that, that journal publishing has really moved from being a you know, circle of gifts, I'm giving you my intellectual ideas for free, we're peer reviewing them for free, uh, we're sharing them uh, uh, for free, it's really moved into a very commercial environment. And it's big business, right? These individual journal prices add up to an industry that is estimated at around $10 billion uh, in terms of revenue generated per year. And just to put that into perspective for you, a $10 billion, another $10 billion a year industry in the US is the National Football League. So the, the business that has grown up in the last um, uh, several decades around uh, journal articles is a significant business. And I recently did a talk at uh, the Open Access Scholarly Publishing Association meeting, and uh, afterwards somebody commented to me that um, that I seemed anti-business. And I, I want to be clear: there's nothing wrong with uh, uh, running a business and you know generating revenue. 
healthy businesses need revenue to operate. I'm not, I'm not anti-business by any stretch of the imagination, but what I do think we need to, to do as a community is to be aware of the choices that we're making and the financial impacts that they, that they have on us. So if, if we just had an industry that was large in scope and generated a lot of revenue, I, you know, I might be inclined to say, well, that's okay. You know, there's, there's a demand for this, this product and this, this service that publishers are providing um, in a commercial environment, and, and that's a good thing, so we should just go, go forward. But I think we have to be aware of the fact that there's another aspect to uh, commercial STM journal publishing uh, in, in, in specific. And that is that out of that $10 billion in revenue per year, roughly 40% of that, or between 35 and close to 40% of that uh, uh, revenue is profit, right? It's not reinvested back into the business, it goes into shareholders' pockets. Journal publishers, uh, our two largest ones, Springer and Elsevier, have some of the highest profit margins out of any competitive industries that we see operating today. And that's something that should give us a little bit of pause. If, uh, if we're able to uh, perhaps operate with a little bit less or even half of that profit margin, it's a significant amount, it's billions of dollars actually, uh, that could be reinvested back into the higher education, the research, the academic uh, uh, processes and, and into our institutions. So um, these barriers have very real uh, sort of cumulative effects across higher education on a large scale. And they have very direct consequences on each one of us as individuals daily. Right? It's not just that this is big business and, and uh, you know, it's, it's something that's happening up at a 30,000 foot level. I would bet that there's probably almost nobody um, on this web, webcast today that hasn't experienced uh, something that looks like this. You know, you're doing a search and you know, Google is our starting point for better or for worse, uh, almost always, on something that you're interested in uh, that you'd like the latest, most up-to-date uh, uh, information on. My um, son actually has uh, type 1 diabetes, so I'm constantly looking for ways to deal with um, staving off nighttime lows, which anybody who's dealt with it knows is, you know, sort of your, it become, becomes the holy grail to figure out how to make it through the night without bottoming out. So uh, you you know, type in your search term, you return a list in Google of articles you think might be interesting to you, you click on it and you say, hmm, yeah, this looks like something I would really like to read uh, uh, based on the abstract, and you say, I'm going to get that full text and see if this is in fact something that's going to be useful to me, and you slam into a paywall that says, in order to read this article and see if it's of use to you, you need to pay me $31.50 or some other, some other fee. Um, and that is, I think, a, 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 an action that's, that is, or a consequence that's familiar to just about anybody in the community. And it happens if your library doesn't have a subscription to every journal under the sun, which no library does, or if you're a student and you're a recent graduate and your library card has expired, or you're like me, I'm not affiliated with an academic institution, so my only option at this point is really to go in uh, through my home computer and try to find, you know, what, what it is that, that, that I can find. Um, it's a really common problem. And I think what I'd like to encourage you to think about is what do you do, right? We're, we all, you know, nod our heads and say, this happens to me regularly. As librarians, we'd love to say, uh, we hear all the time that, you know, you come to the library and you do enter a library loan and we can get it for you and, you know, the world goes on. That happens sometimes. But I will say that on every campus that I've visited, in every uh, uh, situation, you know, no matter where it is, the more common re response is to, so what do you do when you run into this situation on a daily basis, is, you know, I'll go to the author and try to ask him or her directly for a copy. Or I get it for, from a colleague at an institution who I know has a subscription to, to that article. You know, both which are, frankly, violations of, of copyright in, in most cases. We have folks that are getting really, really creative on Twitter, you know, asking, using the hashtag, I can has PDF, to try to get access to, uh, to articles when you run into that paywall. And I'm sure many of you have heard about uh, Sci-Hub, which is actually a large-scale website uh, that hosts, um, illegally hosts, pirated copies of, uh, you know, hundreds of thousands um, if not millions at this point, of, of pirated journal articles. 
um, really, really uh, uh, intense uh, kinds of, of uh, uh, mechanisms to try to get access to, the, to articles. But what, what is really troubling, and I think if you ask yourself, have you done this, most of us will say, you know what, I, not only have I done it, but I do it a, a lot more often than I would like to, to actually admit. We skip the article altogether and go on to one that you do have access to that you don't actually have to do a pay-per-view um, payment for. And what that ends up meaning is we're operating in a system that requires and forces regular workarounds just to do our job. Uh, you end up doing research based on what you have access to. And in a higher ed environment, in a research and teaching environment, you end up teaching students what we have access to rather than what they, what they might need to know. So operating in the system that forces has, I think, led all of us to recognize that we need, we have this fantastic online environment, we have this opportunity, we need to work together mm -hmm. to find strategies to optimize the system of sharing research to better suit the needs of the end users, scholars, students, researchers, everyone in the general public. And that has been what has really driven the movement to, uh, towards open access. And uh, the, the idea behind open access was really a, a group of diverse stakeholders who were sitting down 14 years ago and trying to answer the question of optimizing the system. If we could recreate in the online environment a system that allows uh, researchers and scholars to communicate at an optimal level, what would that system look like? And so the definition of open access that um, we use at Spark is the one that was born out of this, uh, what's called the Budapest Open Access Initiative meeting, which defines open access as these conditions of the free immediate availability of articles on the open uh, internet that also allows you to read, download, copy, uh, crawl as uh, data, uh, pass as data, crawl as, as uh, for indexing, compute, use for any lawful purpose. Um, uh, uh, as the definition of open access. That's a long definition, so I'll shorthand it oftentimes, and you know, it's really important and I think useful to think about when we're talking about open access to articles, the definition is that free immediate availability coupled with the rights to use those articles fully in the digital environment. Right? We're trying to attack the technical barriers, the financial barriers, and the legal barriers in this environment all at one time. So how does it work? How does that then manifest itself for you on a daily basis? Is there, are there ways that you can actually, you know, we have this definition, can, can we build this system? And we've made some good progress towards doing that and there are several uh, uh, ways that, that you can kind of uh, uh, go about um, uh, enabling a full open access system. And since we're talking, um, when we're talking about open access, at its heart, we're talking about the journal environment. It really makes sense for us to have a robust technical infrastructure and an open infrastructure to support journals that are published using uh, open, open access terms and conditions, financial, legal, uh, technical terms and conditions. And so um, we have seen over the last decade and change a very robust set of uh, fully open access journals uh, being made available to scholars and researchers to publish in, in just about any discipline that we can think about um, and globally around the world. This really is a, a, a phenomena that is mirrors the global nature of the uh, scholarly and, and research environment. The Directory of Open Access Journals is a phenomenal resource uh, that, that, uh, you, that I would you know, strongly suggest that you take a look at, the journals that are available. There are um, uh, ever increasing uh, requirements, quality requirements for editorial policies and practices that are required for you to be listed in the DOAJ. And currently the Directory of Open Access Journals, li journals lists more than um, 10,000 journals uh, that are in uh, the directory. One thing that's really important to know about open access journals is that in general, open access journals use the same editorial peer review, copy editing, and quality control processes as traditional subscription access journals. The initial, this initial set of journals, I would say, sort of was a one-to-one -one, uh, flip of simply taking what has been done in the subscription environment 
and changing the underlying access model and, re and point of payment. So nothing really radical about the vast majority of the journals that are indexed in the DOAJ. That said, a little bit later on in the presentation, I will talk about uh, some of the newer features that are beginning to be enabled in this open environment uh, that are, are um, maybe moving a little bit more towards a radical realization of a full open access system. But in terms of the journals in the DOAJ, uh, they look very much like journals, uh, they operate very much like journals uh, that we're used to seeing in a subscription environment. Um, and if you can't find the perfect journal to publish in, you don't have to despair. There's another piece of infrastructure very important to our campuses, our funders, and our research labs uh, that are open access repositories where you can actually put an article regardless of the journal that you've published it in and make it available to the community under open access uh, terms and conditions. There's more than 3,000 of these repositories available um, all around the world, as you can see by, from, from this slide. Uh, it, it is uh, open access repositories have become a very important uh, piece of uh, uh, the fabric of supporting open access and are in wide use um, around the world. Um, when you choose to use an open access repository, really in order for your, your uh, uh, paper to be um, fully available under open access terms and conditions, it's important to think about using uh, uh, the, the proper legal tool to secure uh, the, the rights for, for uh, readers and potential reusers of your work. Um, and that is another strategy that you can use as an author to ensure that your work is available um, in a full open access uh, mechanism. And that's to use an open license like a Creative Commons license to apply to, to the work that you're doing. And it's interesting because people sometimes seem to we all do. We all forget that uh, we have those rights to our own work unless or until we sign over some or all. You can reserve the rights to do things in an open environment that you'd like to do and still publish in a, um, a, a subscription access journal. If you attach an open license to, uh, if you reserve the rights to attach an open license to the article that you publish in a repository, you can make sure that all of the things that we need to do to you know, kind of get past that hurdle of, of, of not being able to digest as a, you know, a single human being reading our articles, uh, but to enable computer, computers as another category of readers to fully unlock the value of digital articles, um, that those rights are attendant to your article as well. Um, the last thing that I wanna talk a little bit about um, before we talk about some of the more uh, interesting and, and perhaps slightly more radical uh, developments in open access journals is there's, a, there's a, a movement afoot that I know you will all be familiar with from, from one direction or another to, um, and I put this in quotes, to incentivize the use of open access channels as well. And this movement has sort of taken two uh, directions. Um, and I like to think about it as sticks and carrots. I know most of us will be familiar with the notion of an, an open access policy or a public access requirement from our funder, from our institution, uh, uh, from various levels. Um, the, the idea of uh, requiring uh, recipients of funded research to make their, their funded papers or articles reporting on their funded research openly available is really catching fire, as you can see over the last, um, over the last decade. We see high level requirements coming down from uh, here in the United States, um, uh, the, the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy has asked all federal agencies that fund science to have requirements that papers are made openly available. Private funders like the Gates Foundation um, have also implemented similar fairly stringent requirements that kick in in 2017 for open sharing of, of scholarly papers. Our research institutions are increasingly uh, looking at and implementing policies that say while you're employed, while you're a faculty, um, we agree that it is you know, just a matter of course of being a faculty member here that we will make our, our papers openly available either through journals or through our institution's digital repository. Uh, so uh, really a, a, a growing trend of, of sticks, and they're not punitive sticks, right? Funders look at it as a way to increase the value of their research investment uh, higher education institutions look at it as a way to 
increase the visibility um, of the, the intellectual output that the campus generates and to raise the visibility of the brand, frankly, of the, the wonderful work that's done on our campuses. But it's still, any requirement feels like a stick and in, you know, so I sort of characterize it under, under that broad heading. But we're also starting to see some carrots uh, um, come into play. And I think it's really interesting uh, to explore that for, for a second. The, the idea around open access is, of course, you know, sharing research is, it, widely is a, is a good thing for a variety of reasons. But as an individual researcher, part of the drivers towards thinking about wanting to utilize open access as a strategy for sharing your work is that the theory is that if you make your article openly available, more people can get to it, more people will read it, and the more people who do that, the more will cite your work and build on your work. And whether we love it or hate it, Right now, citations are um, the coin of the realm in, in uh, the academy, and uh, you know it, it, it matters at this point. So the question is, does it happen? If we openly share our work, um, do you find that, that people actually uh, cite your work more, more frequently? There's now been, because open access has been in place for uh, roughly 14 years, there's um, almost four dozen uh, individual research studies that have been done looking at various aspects of citation, potential citation advantages. And we definitely see that across disciplines, a varying degree of, um, of uh, positive lift in the number of citations uh, occurring um, if you publish your articles in open access journals. And it really doesn't matter what the discipline is. We have studies that look at uh, publication in open access journals and non-OA journals over the same time period in clinical medicine that show an increase, engineering that show an increase, social sciences that show an increase. Essentially, you name the discipline. There is, at least initially after publication, within the first year or two years, uh, a boost in citation. And that's an important time frame for articles. Will it last over time? You know, the jury obviously is still out for longitudinal studies to look at what happens over time. But at least initially, that notion um, that you would expect um, appears to be borne out, which is important for us to know as individuals who are judged by, um, um, at least partially, by this criteria. And this same phenomena also holds true, we've seen in studies of putting publications and making them available via open access repositories as well as journals. Um, Tom Cochran, uh, who is the VC for research at QUT in uh, Brisbane, uh, in particular, was very aggressive about looking at the impact on not only individual researchers, but where they were in the point of their career, and if you deposited in, in a repository, did you get the same kind of helpful boost that you would get uh, from publishing in a journal? And found, again, um, really significant rates of uh, in increased downloads and increased citations, and it didn't, doesn't really matter where you're a mature researcher, you're a mid-career, you're an early career researcher, uh, these kinds of bumps appear to um, to hold true in many, many cases. So very important because I think while we would like people to say, you know, open access is important on a societal level, we're, we're all human and we're motivated by wanting to make sure that, you know, our, our self-interest is also served. And frankly, you know, we, we, we need promotion, we need uh, funding for our work. And these things, these things are, are currently the way that we're judged. And I emphasize currently the way that we're judged because now I want to talk a little bit about some of the perhaps more interesting and slightly more radical things that are happening in the open access journal environment, ways that, uh, things that can happen in this open environment that uh, can't thrive in a closed and subscription environment. And one of those is looking at uh, the idea that there's much more to impact of our work than just citations. Right? We all know that intuitively and we all feel that in our, in our hearts. And the open digital environment really lets us collect information on lots of different aspects and potential aspects of impact. There's a growing um, body of uh, uh, metrics that are emerging that can be attached to individual articles from the moment of publication in an open environment that can uh, measure all kinds of different elements and uh, uh, aspects of uh, the, the, the downstream impact that your work is having in the world. Of course, it can measure usage and citations, can measure them from a wide variety of sources because the metric is actually attached to your individual article and will carry through uh, wherever your article is mentioned 
uh, um, article level metrics packages will help you collect that information from a wide variety of sources. But it will also, ALMs will also let us look at who's talking about our work in comments on a journal site, in any kind of rating system that it may be a part of. It'll help us aggregate information about conversations about our work in social media, whether it's academic social media like Mendeley, Conatea, or you know, traditional social media like Facebook and Twitter. Lots of conversations happening about scholarly and scientific works in those two uh, social media and, and in many social media arenas. And it also lets us look at, um, is our work mentioned in any of the popular blogs in our discipline, in the media, trade press, or popular press? And these are all things that, that uh, matter to greater or lesser degrees to different departments, to different deans, to different people, funders, people who are judging our work. Um, they're fairly easy to apply. This is just a very quick snapshot of an article in a, an open access journal, a PLOS journal, that has article level metrics associated with it. It's an article, it's only about eight months old, so um, you know, it's, uh, uh, it's got 45,000 total article views. Is that good or bad? Well, you know, if, if the author was expecting that only 10 of his closest friends were gonna like this article or care about it, then he's feeling pretty good about the views. If on the other hand, the author thought this was a Nobel Prize winning type groundbreaking article, they may not be quite so happy, but it allows us to, to, to generate this very robust view very quickly. And if we scroll down on that article, we would also see these other uh, measures. Um, again, eight months after an article is published, you wouldn't expect to see very many citations, but you can see that there's something going on in terms of a buzz on, on social media, both on academic social media in Mendeley and in Facebook. And you can drill down in both of these cases and see uh, more information about who's talking about your work and what they're saying. And I think this is a really interesting new aspect of the open publication environment is that we have new ways to see who's using our work, where it's used, and even find out a little bit more about how it's being used. And it also, these kinds of metrics help us to put uh, a, a broader palette of metrics about use and reach of articles into a broader context, which can help us tell a, a more robust story about the reach and the breadth and the depth and the impact of our work in whatever evaluation process that, um, that we're about to, to undergo. Um, another aspect of uh, the sort of uh, limitations of the current system uh, that an open access environment can help address is frustration over speed of publication. And this is something that is uh, gaining, uh, I would say, a lot of attention uh, fairly recently. Um, speed of publication is a real concern for many authors. Um, again, having been a journal editor, I'm painfully aware of uh, what some of the lag times can be between submission, final decision, and publication of papers. Um, you know, with a median hovering around uh, 100 days, uh, uh, this, that's three, three and a half months, is, you know, actually not, not too bad, but many of us are familiar with um, uh, having papers rejected, having to resubmit, revise and re-review, and processes that can go on for, frankly, a year or longer than a year. Uh, and that has caused folks to really, especially in very fast-moving disciplines, um, to look at ways to um, mitigate getting ideas to uh, not just market, but ideas to colleagues so that they can be worked on and built on um, more expeditiously. And that's led really to a rise in the use of uh, the, the idea of preprint servers, where articles that have not yet been submitted to a journal that are you know, sort of in uh, the form that are just about ready to go, or may, maybe not even just, just about ready to go, but the idea is ready to be shared are posted openly and publicly for folks to see. Archive is the, the leader in that, that sense, um, located at Cornell in high energy physics. It's been around since the early 90s. High energy physics has always had a culture of early sharing of ideas, even in a paper-based environment. But recently, just over the last two years, BioArchive and the Biomedical Sciences has been established at Cold Spring Harbor, and more recently, uh, social Archive for the Social Sciences is a very, very recent addition to the landscape uh, being launched at the and hosted uh, at the University of Maryland. 
So the, this, there's also a movement of what you may have heard of ASAP Bio, uh, which is a, a group of very energetic uh, early career researchers and, um, and folks who are working to try to encourage a culture of uh, early sharing of research articles in a preprint environment springing up. So definitely something to keep your eye on um, in terms of the open, uh, open uh, access environment. Um, another aspect of uh, the open environment that is uh, really beginning to percolate and, and we're, we're starting to see some very interesting developments is the notion of uh, reforming peer review in the open environment by, um, uh, by making it a much more open and transparent process. Uh, the idea of open peer review, um, there's great discussion. Peer, peer review week was actually uh, held in, in September. And I was trying to think like we, we're celebrating open access week. Do we celebrate peer review week or do we actually just mark peer review week? I don't know. I don't want to be judgmental. Who, who can say what the right, what the right word is there? Um, but certainly the conversation about uh, looking at some of the, the, um, the current issues with a single blind uh, peer review system that we have now, um, anonymous peer review, uh, there's concerns about uh, obviously bias, concerns that competitors can review our work rather than uh, people who have our best interest in mind. Um, uh, the the anon anonymity can provide cover for, um, shall we say, not the most polite reviews or productive reviews. The users don't get to see what the reviewers have said, so you're not aware as a reader of the full story behind the article. Um, and there's a, been a movement to uh, experiment with and in many cases move full bore into open and transparent peer review. Um, I think uh, it, it's very interesting to see, this is actually a snapshot from Faculty of a Thousand and I realize I didn't attribute this slide, which I will correct. Uh, Faculty of a Thousand uh, Journal uh, has kind of enumerated the potential benefits of open peer review for authors and readers, right? And that, uh, they, they, they feel very strongly that it, it, it goes a long way in addressing uh, the concerns that, um, that we just talked about. Um, additionally, uh, you know, that it can also help put paper, papers into context, right? Being able to actually see the reviews helps give you a much fuller sense of uh, the conversation around that paper. I think of it sort of in the same vein as article level metrics, right? We're, we're, we're only seeing a piece of the, the puzzle we're only seeing a small slice of the story of science and research now in, uh, in, a, in more, uh, a more closed environment. So an open access environment, I think, has the potential to, to enable um, lots of different benefits like this. And there are a lot of journals that are, are actually uh, utilizing open peer review. So if you're interested in checking it out, there's some very established journals from Faculty of 1000 to the BMJ uh, to some very new uh, outlets. The Welcome Open Research outlet is, was just launched actually uh, a couple of weeks ago by the largest biomedical funder in the UK. Uh, they have an end-to-end -end open and transparent publishing system uh, for not only their funded researchers, but for other researchers in the biomedical sciences to try out. And that includes an open peer review module as well. Okay, all good. So I'm going to close up now um, uh, by uh, talking about uh, the fact that I, it's really important for us as individuals that we recognize that the open environment shows some promise for helping to extend the value, the visibility, and the impact of, uh, of our individual research outputs. But open access, just as importantly, open access can have a positive impact far beyond our, our individual work, our individual libraries, and deep into our society as a whole. And kind of go back to the, the notion that uh, uh, the web and, and internet technology is part of the impetus for um, uh, driving us towards this vision of open access. And using open access as a strategy can help us use the internet for what it was actually built at its core to do. And that's communicate and collaborate in real time to solve big problems and to work to improve the public good. The internet was built to do these things specifically um, uh, uh, to support global real, uh, real time collaborations, create huge large scale opportunities for new discoveries, 
and just as important to democratize uh, 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 access to information, equally empowering all scholars, anybody who's interested in looking uh, at this material, and taking down digital divides. We think about this, um, the importance of open access and fueling the public good uh, at Spark in a very specific way these days. We find that when we go out and we talk about open access as a concept or open because open's better than closed, it only gets us halfway to this end story. Where it's hard to, to get people to understand exactly what can happen if you utilize open as a strategy. So we've, ta we've begun to talk about open access as open as a strategy in order to. Opening up access to different layers of our work in order to achieve specific goals. Opening up access to research articles in order to speed up progress towards curing a specific disease. Opening up access to data in order to prevent an infectious disease pandemic like Zika from taking hold. Opening up access to textbooks in order to make college more affordable to students. So finishing the sentence, making it clear that open isn't, it's not a binary, it's, it's, an, it's actually an enabling strategy uh, to help us achieve larger, larger aims. Um, and we like to think uh, a, a lot, and we encourage you, especially during Open Access Week, to think about what's possible if we use open as an enabling strategy and think about collectively setting the default mode to open in research and education. Um, thank you so much for listening. I'm going to stop here and happy to take any questions and uh, continue the conversation. Great. Thank you, Heather. Are there some questions that have come up throughout this conversation in the last 45 minutes or so? If so, please. A lot of type information in a short period of time, I realize. I'm like, yeah, um, well, I mean, and I think what's kind of interesting is, so one of the things that we're talking about at a SUNY level is, you know, how do we work together to make this happen? And it seems, uh, so do you have an experience of, you know, consortia or, you know, state level, you know, institutions working together to make a, a broad statement? So, I mean, a lot of us are aware of the Harvard open access mandate, um, but is there is there something that could be particularly impactful at a, you know, consortial level or how, how do we, work together to, to make this a very strong initiative? That's a great question. And um, we actually do have uh, a little bit of experience with a statewide system uh, working um, across the system to develop uh, first an open access, a resolution that open access was something that the uh, system wants to work towards, and that's at the University of California. Um, the office of the, the president actually spearheaded the movement along with uh, the individual libraries in the system and the California Digital Library. And they started with this just coming to consensus that there were some statements and principles that they, they were comfortable um, coalescing around as a system. And in terms of, you know, the drivers behind open access and the, the, the kind of articulating the ideal vision for research sharing, research communication, sharing of scholarship system-wide, that was a very useful, I think, um, uh, uh, prism for them to look through to, to take a, an initial first step. And it, you know, it was a long, a large, uh, a long-term process. It was uh, several years after a resolution that they wanted to work towards a culture that enabled open sharing um, of, of research and scholarship across the system that they then moved into sort of the second phase, which was to design uh, a policy. And it was really from the faculty senate level then up through the system, uh, the statewide system, uh, that they actually agreed on a system-wide policy where um, open is, is essentially the default for uh, first faculty members and active researchers, and then more recently, the policy has been expanded to include even graduate students uh, and and um, uh, uh, other uh, non not non full time faculty members on campus. So, the collective aspect of it is certainly critical. Um, 
I would, you know, it is time consuming. There's no, no two ways about it, but um, I think it's been a very, very valuable exercise across the, um, the UC system for them to do. It's really interesting. Thanks for sharing that. There's a question from uh, SUNY Maritime and they say, do you have any advice for libraries or academics working in a very specialized discipline um, which tends to protect data? Uh, in terms of um, encouraging open sharing of, of data underlying articles, is that the direction that the question is going in? Yeah, that's that's what it sounds like to me. Um, and open data is something that uh, quite a few uh, institutions are, you know, interested in, and that's a little bit different than articles. So I would say that that's a, a good interpretation of that. Yeah, I, you know, this Open Access Week, we were actually chatting offline before this um, webinar started that this year's Open Access Week activities have included, for the first time, a pretty significant um, a uh, subset of, uh, of, of activities around opening up research data as well. And I think that that, that and intersection Heather, is Heather, you valuable. Cut out there for a second. Oh, sorry, can you still hear me? We want to back up just a little bit, cut out a little bit. Yep. Oh, that's so odd. Okay. Um, uh, this Open Access Week has really been the first time that we've seen a real overlap uh, between uh, research data sharing and open access uh, to, to, to articles on a, on a pretty significant level. Um, I, I think a lot of people are looking at incentivizing uh, sharing of data. I, I don't think we're going to see the kind of policies that say thou shalt share your data no matter what that we have kind of seen in the research article environment that funders, uh, you know, employers recognize that in the data environment, the goal for us is to be as open as possible, but as closed as necessary to protect, you know, privacy, uh, legitimate interests. And there are lots of legitimate interests. But I think thinking about incentives right now is one of the more productive paths to go down. And whether the incentive is you're incentivized as a researcher, frankly, in, again, the funding, the tenure and promotion process, is one route. Um, incentivizing uh, researchers across institutions to share data because the institution has a goal of improving uh, transparency or uh, measurability of you know, reproducible research outputs, whatever the um, uh, particular strategy that might be effective uh, for you, I think we have some routes that are, are developing that are very promising uh, to help us at least point the way to folks to, to help them if, if, if you are interested in exploring it. We're not telling you you have to do it, but maybe we can help you to you know, dip a toe into the data sharing waters and see that good things can accrue to you as an individual and to the, your discipline as a whole and the institution. Um, it feels like that's a, a fairly productive way to, to kind of think about going forward. Yeah, reproducibility is such a big issue right now. And I know in class with some graduate students yesterday, we were talking about research ethics um, and how open data um, or the publication along with the raw data sets, I mean, it's, it's going to be a, a totally different or significantly different ballgame for the next generation or even the current generations um, uh, of researchers um, because people could, you know, potentially, you know, look at the data points and say, you know, this doesn't make sense. Um, and there's just so much data out there that it's going to be a really interesting, um, you know, evolution when it comes to all of this openness. What are we going to do with all of this information once we have it? Um, Absolutely. There's a there's a lot of really good questions um, coming in now, and I'm afraid that we're not going to get to all of them. Um, but one that I think is particularly interesting, um, especially based on some of the SUNY conversations that we've been having lately, is so this is coming from Alfred University and New York State College of Ceramics. Um, federal funding mandates uh, that sharing of articles one year after publication. Um, so do you see any changes coming um, in the future uh, for state universities who get their funding from tax dollars. So do you think that, that embargo period is likely to change or even maybe is, is copyright going to change um, 
um, you know, right now there's the, the rule questions. of five. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, we'll see in this next, uh, the, with the next Congress and the next um, administration, what happens. But I would say, um, yes, there are, yes to both. In fact, I, I would see changes uh, uh, coming down the pike. Clearly, there are, um, uh, there is an interest in reducing the embargo period around particularly biomedical research articles. Um, I would point to some recent comments that the vice president has made in his Cancer Moonshot Initiative, uh, talking about the need to accelerate progress to treatments and cures in that particular discipline. I wouldn't be surprised if we, if we, I would be surprised if we didn't see pilots from some subset of federally funded research moving to six months, potentially even zero embargoes in the next uh, not too distant future. Um, with copyright, um, well, that's a that's an area that that is the crystal ball is a little bit murkier after this weekend. Um, the Copyright Office was certainly very interested in opening up, for example, Section 108 uh, in for consultation with Congress to look at fair use provisions and not necessarily, the vibe wasn't necessarily that it was in a helpful way, but um, I think we all saw that uh, the new Librarian of Congress uh, has actually begun a shakeup in the Copyright Office. So we'll have to wait and see who's appointed as the new Registrar of Copyrights before I think any of us can begin to accurately read the tea leaves on you know, whether this is gonna be what the new direction might look like. And it may in fact end up being a positive direction for copyright reform, which would be a, a wonderful thing. Um, certainly there's a, a real climate of fear whenever you raise the word copyright um, in a public policy setting here in Washington and the words open licenses. Uh, afterwards, people just feel like, oh, it's untested, the industry will push back, it'll just be, it'll be a nightmare. So actually having an environment where perhaps there's some more clarity and um, lack of fear would be a very welcome uh, development. So we'll have to watch the space. I know we all will be watching the space very closely. Well, I'm really glad that you're involved in those conversations. Um, Spark is such a good advocate for you know so many of the scholarly communication types of activities that we're engaged in. Um, and it's, it's 12.58, uh, I think it's time to wrap up. So I just want to say thank you to all of our participants today. Thank you for all of your questions, um, tons of good questions. Um, and especially thank you to Heather Joseph, um, a very, very interesting and engaging presentation. For the, for the participants, um, please just take two minutes after this is over, um, there's a very short survey. So if you have any questions um, or, or anything like that, we're capturing them in the chat. You can certainly include them in that uh, survey. Um, but please just take two minutes to review this series and provide us with some feedback so we can use that to focus future OA efforts. Your input is really highly valued and we appreciate you spending time with us today. If you know someone who wanted to see this or if you want to encourage other people to view this, um, probably by the end of the day today, the webinar will be posted on our open access website. Um, so please see the chat box for the URL. I'm going to copy that right now. It'll take me just one second. There it is again. Um, there's also a list of all of the committee members. And please join us tomorrow. Allison Brown is going to be talking about SUNY OER services. On Thursday, we have um, Molly and Amy from University at Buffalo's The Reading Room talking about starting and sustaining an OEA publication. Um, and then on Friday, Jill Siracella from CUNY is going to talk about understanding and protecting your, auth your rights as an author. So I think um, you know maybe we'll get into some of these other questions. Um, so please stay tuned and Again, thank you to Heather and thank you to everyone who, uh, who joined us today. So hopefully we'll see you tomorrow. Thanks so much.